Amen. Hey, listen, we're in part two of a series that we started last week titled More Like David. And I'm excited to jump uh, back into the series today. If you missed last week's message, I highly encourage you to go back on YouTube and watch it. I just want to make this announcement. There is nothing wrong with this front row right here. This is actually the, the blessed and highly favored section right here. And so if you want to be blessed and highly favored, there's about six seats right there for you. Um, just so you guys know, um, the 9 a.m. service, and this is no exaggeration, we had about 40 uh, kids' chairs pulled in here. There was people standing in the back, and we had about 60 people in the lobby watching the service. And so um, you asked us why we're going to three services. That's why we're going to three services. And so next week, don't show up at 11. Show up either 10, uh, 15, or 11.45, or 8.30 in the morning if you're feeling real spiritual that day. Um, hey, let's get into the word today. I, I, I know this message will bless you. It's a, it's a little teachy today. I want to teach you the word of God. And uh, there's a lot of scripture. I hope that doesn't offend anyone in uh, church today. That there's a lot of scripture. Is that okay? You guys are not offended by the Bible. That's good news. I need to know who I'm talking to this morning, okay? And so if you like something that I'm saying, you can say, uh, that was good. You can say, so good. You can say, preacher white boy or preacher black boy. Either one. I'm okay with. Or what's like a um what's a Latino one I could say? Dale mas. You can say dale mas because I got a little Latino in me too. And so uh, David and Goliath is what we're gonna uh, look at today. And so you came on a, an amazing day. Now before you just check out and go, I already know the story. I already know how it ends. David beats Goliath. Great. Um, this is amazing. Thanks, Pastor. I brought a friend, and you're preaching David and Goliath. Um, before you check out, I want to just encourage you to lean in. I think that God wants to speak something to you through this story. And typically the way the story is told is through a Western uh, point of view, right? We look at sports teams or we look at individuals and we're like, hey, uh, look at what they overcame. The odds were not in their favor. And yet they beat this big giant team or this person with all the resources and all the favor on their side. And that's typically what we get out of the story. But I want to look a little bit deeper into the story um, because I think that a lot of times we miss the very heart of what this story is trying to tell us. Last week, we saw the prophet Samuel anoint David as the next king of Israel. And really what we were witnessing was the identification of a king. God told Samuel to go to Jesse's house and one of his sons will be the next king. This week, as we look at this famous story, we're going to see not just the identification of a king, we're really going to see the introduction of a king. And so this will not be in the typical way that you expect, and I pray that God speak something to you that will change your life. Amen? So 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm just going to read the Bible, and then we'll stop every once in a while and talk about it. Is that cool? 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, it says this, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at, so at Sokah in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephah's Damon between Sokah and Ezekah. How many of you guys already checked out? And you're like, yeah, I don't know what we're talking about. Get to the good part. Uh, verse 2, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley in between them. Let's stop there for a moment. What you have to remember is the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. God told Abraham all the way back in Genesis that I will bless you and your descendants. Those that come after you will also be blessed. And so now this nation, these chosen people of God, are getting ready to go to battle against the Philistine army. I don't know about you, but if I had a promise from God that was passed down from generation to generation, it didn't matter what battle I was going to face, I would feel confident in that battle knowing that God was on my side, knowing that this land, this place, this promised land that God has for us, nobody can take this from us. If God is for us, then who can be against us? And so the nation of Israel should be confident in this moment that it doesn't matter what army is coming against us, God is on our side. But something happens in verse 4. Let's read it. It says, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That, that's about nine feet, nine inches tall. That's a big boy. Bigger than Chase, bigger than... Zach, the, the guys I had here on the stage last week, bigger than those boys. Verse 5, 6, and 7 goes on to describe the way Goliath looked. It goes on to describe his armor. It goes on to describe the, the weight of his armor. It was about 125 pounds. It goes on to describe that he had a spear on his back for throwing. He had a sword in his hand for fighting. He had a bronze helmet 
a bronze chest weight. He was ready for battle. The Bible gives us a lot of detail about this battle in the description of how Goliath looked and what he had on. And the reason it does that is because the writer is trying to draw you in to the fear of the children of Israel. He's trying to get you to experience that they were actually scared of this man named Goliath. Remember what we learned last week when Saul, uh, well, excuse me, when uh, Samuel showed up to Jesse's house to anoint David, who came out first, Eliab, the big boy, the alpha, the first son, right? And God checked Samuel's spirit in that moment and said, hey, remember, I don't look at the outside. I don't look at the stature or the height of a man. Rather, I look at the heart. See, because when God is on your side, you shouldn't be intimidated by any giants that you're facing. Why? Because God's on your side. But rather, we should be encouraged that no matter how big, how big the problem is or the giant is or the struggle is, God is bigger. Amen? God is greater more than any giant that we're facing. We're facing. So a question for you this morning is, will you trust God when there's a giant standing in front of you? Now, I'll admit to you this. It's much easier to preach this than it is to live this. It's much easier to say, yeah, pastor, I'm, gonna, I'm not scared of any giants in my life until that nine-foot, nine-inch man comes and stares you down, and you're about all of 5'8", right? Until so that giant bill comes or that doctor's phone call comes and he's staring you in the face. It's easy to have confidence in these four walls. It's easy to be a Christian in here and throw up our hands and praise you again and again. But when Goliath is facing you face to face, it's much harder. Will you trust God even when there's a giant standing in front of you? Verse 8. Skip down a little bit. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, he will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. The life is essentially saying, there's no need for all this bloodshed. Just send your best guy, who was supposed to be Saul, against me. And whoever wins, well, that will be the winner. And then Goliath says this in verse 10, This day I defy the armies of Israel. That word defy is used many times. It's, it's a taunt. It's a blaspheme. It's a disgrace. It's a, an offense. He said, I offend your God. I blaspheme your God. I put your God down. He says, give me a man and let us fight each other. Now, again, picture the moment. These are the children of Israel chosen by God. They should have confidence in God. What was their response to me? Verse 11. On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all of the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Let's preach from this message today from this title, The Unlikely Hero. The Unlikely Hero. Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these stories, truths, and principles that we can pull out and not just see stories, God, but we can see you. Holy Spirit, have your way in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Uh, true story, real quick this morning, there's a husband and a wife and a son. The son is about 10 years old. The parents had been married for about 22 years. Now, the husband, um, although he was a good man, he found himself highly addicted to uh, drugs, hard drugs. Uh, so you could just picture the struggle of the marriage when someone is addicted day in and day out to very, very hard drugs. So much so to the point where he found himself in prison many years of the marriage. He found himself... Uh, without money or homeless, and it was just a hard life that they found themselves in. And so one day, after 22 years, the wife, this is a true story, goes to her husband and says, hey, I want a divorce. I want out. I've had enough. I can't take the addiction anymore. I've tried. I've given everything that I can, but I can't do it anymore. Your son is now 10 years old, and he's watching you live this life. We can't take it anymore. I want out. And so she uh, goes to the, her pastor later on in the week, Unless the pastor know, hey, we're going to be getting a divorce. I can't take it anymore. He's just too addicted. I can't deal with the ups and downs of life anymore. And the pastor says, okay, I understand. Um, can we just set a meeting maybe for the three of us to sit down and talk and just see how I can help you guys in any way? And so she agrees to it. So she tells her husband, hey, I set a meeting up with the pastor. He wants all of our family to go. And so the husband and wife, they show up to the meeting with the pastor along with their son. And the pastor sits him down and says, hey, you know, I've heard of what's going on, the addiction. Divorce papers, I have an offer for you guys. 
I want to offer a rehabilitation program for your husband, for you. We've looked into it. Our church staff has looked into it. We found the best one in the country, five stars. It's a two-year program, but it, the uh, completion rate, the success rate is almost 100%. Every man who goes to this problem, who's dealt with your exact situation, comes out on the other side clean. And so you could just picture this moment, the wife begins to cry. It's like man falling from heaven. It's a real miracle getting answered right there in this moment. The son is just excited because he knows his dad is finally going to get some help. And the man is just staring back at the pastor and says, Pastor, I appreciate the offer and I'm excited for it, but I do just have three questions for you. Number one, uh, is there a curfew? Like, is there a time that I got to wake up and a time I got to go to bed at this rehab? And the pastor's kind of confused. He looks back and says, you know, yeah, like there's a lot of structure. There's a lot of, you know, they're trying to get some, some routines in your life to help you better your life. So, yeah, there's a, there's a curfew. So he says, okay, my second question for you, is it cafeteria-style food or do I have to pick my own food? And the, the pastor looks back and goes, you know, there's about, a, there's about 200 men there, and so uh, it's, it's cafeteria-style food. They've got to feed a lot, of, a lot of people. And he says, okay, last question for you. Um, do I get my own room or do I have a roommate when I go? And the pastor says, again, you know, there's, there's about 200 guys there, and so there's limited space, and so you have a roommate, someone that's assigned to the room with you. And he says, okay, I need to let you know that I'm not going. That sounds like prison. See, because his memories of what was, his memories of his past, his memories of the life that he was living was keeping him from stepping into the miracle that was right in front of him. And see, how many of you know that you can be in such a negative mindset that God wants to do a new thing in your life, but you're so stuck in the past and you're so stuck in what the enemy did to you that you can't step into the new thing that God wants to do for you? And see, that's exactly what was happening to King Saul. Saul was anointed to be the king of Israel, just like David was anointed to be the king of Israel. God looked and spoke to Samuel and said, that's the man, that's the next king. Anoint him with oil. Saul was anointed by God to lead the children of Israel. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Saul had led Israel in other battles against the Ammonites and had victories, and God was for them. And God showed up on his behalf. But now we see him getting ready to face this other army, the Philistines. And what is Saul doing? Saul is cowering in fear instead of standing in confidence. He knows the miracle is right before him. He knows that God is with him. But yet his own insecurities, his own doubts, his own trouble, his own fear of who he was, was compromising him from stepping into the thing that God actually wanted for him. So Saul's heart begins to get discouraged, and Saul's mind begins to, get, begins to get discouraged. And because he was a scared leader, his soldiers were scared. Write this down. No one likes a scared leader. No one likes a scared leader. What are you leading in your life right now out of fear? Fathers, are you leading with confidence or are you leading with fear? Because let me tell you this, your family is only going to go as far as your faith will take them. Are you leading an organization right now out of fear or out of confidence because you will only see the results that you have the faith to believe for? No one likes a scared leader. People will follow you for a little bit, but once they find out you're scared, once they find out you're insecure, once they, once they find out that your heart really isn't in it, don't really follow for too much longer. And that's exactly what's happening to Saul in this moment. He should be confident. He's the king. He's the leader. He's chosen by God. But yet he's cowering in fear at the taunt of Goliath. So what happens next? Verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephratite named Jesse. We read about this last week. Who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. David was son number eight, the number of new beginnings. And in Saul's time... Jesse was very old. See, we learned last week that David was overlooked by his brothers. Remember, he was forgotten about. He was left out in the field. He wasn't even given the opportunity to be anointed king based on what his dad said. Now, verse 13, Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second, Abinadab, and the third, Shema. Keep in mind, at the time of the battle of David and Goliath, David was already anointed king. But yet, David was not appointed king yet. 
So you could be anointed, but not yet appointed. Come on, how many you know that you can have the presence and the favor and God's anointing and blessing on your life, but you have not yet stepped into the place that God has for you? Someone say, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. I'm anointed. I'm just not yet appointed. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. See, David was anointed to be king, but he just wasn't appointed yet. He was still a boy. He had stepped into his role. See, here's the real story of David and Goliath, because we tell, like, oh, David gets anointed, and then he just goes back into the field, and all of a sudden he's fighting David and Goliath, or Goliath. But the real story is this. Uh, Samuel comes to his house. David gets anointed to be the next king of Israel. David then goes back out to work in the field. David goes back out to take care of the sheep that his father had. Right? Then, okay, his dad, Jesse, gets a phone call. This is, this is my version. I don't know if it was a sheet, a, a tweet, a text, a DM, I don't know what it was, but he got contacted, right? Get the phone call from the palace where Saul lives. Because Saul at the time was dealing with nightmares. Saul at the time was dealing with demons. Saul at the time was dealing with these night tremors that he could not do anything about. And so Saul, the king of Israel, is speaking to his servant in the palace and says, hey, I'm dealing with these nighttime terrors. Do you know anyone who can help me with these nightmares? The servant to the king says, yeah, I know a boy who lives out in Bethlehem, the son of Jesse. He has good character. He's brave. He can play the harp really good. Get a hold of him. And so Saul reaches out to Jesse and says, hey, I heard your son can help me with my nightmares. So David then goes and lives at the palace. David then goes and stays at Saul's kingdom, Saul's palace. And every time that Saul would have a nightmare or deal with demons, David will walk into the room with his guitar and start singing. And the Bible says that every time David stepped into the room, hell would flee. The nightmares would stop. The trembles would go away. And so David stays at Saul's house, the kingdom, for about a year and a half. Then all of a sudden, Saul goes to war with the Philistines. David goes back home to Jesse's house. And then we pick up in verse 18. When David gets back home after living at the palace for a year and a half, verse 18 says, Jesse is like, hey, take along these 10 cheese, uh, cheeses to the commander of the unit. See how your brothers are doing and uh, bring us back some assurance. So as soon as David gets back from the palace, his dad's immediately like, hey, go check on your brothers. He's still overlooked. He's still not thought about as the next anointed king. And it's important to notice how David arrives at the battlefield. He doesn't show up looking like a warrior. David doesn't show up looking like a soldier. David shows up to the battlefield with pizzas looking like a delivery boy. Looking like DoorDash. He doesn't look very impressive. He doesn't fit in. He's a boy amongst all these men who are at war. He looks humble. He looks small. Skip down to verse 23. As he was talking with the men, so David shows up and he begins to talk to the soldiers. As he was talking with the men, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual offense. And David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, Goliath, they all fled from him in great fear. Picture the scene for a moment. All the soldiers are standing there talking. David shows up with pizzas to take care of his brothers and the soldiers and to bring a report back to the father. Then all of a sudden, Goliath, out of the Israelite, uh, out of the uh, Philistine army, comes forth and begins his usual taunt. So Goliath had been doing this for many days. He begins shouting. He begins taunting. He begins blaspheming. He begins putting down all the children of God. And what do the soldiers do? What does the chosen people of God do? They run in fear. Oh, doesn't this sound too familiar? Come on, there's people every single day of our lives who taunt God, who blaspheme God, who say untrue things about God, who put down God, who mock God, who make fun of God, the God that you serve, the God that gave you a hope in the future, the God that blessed you, the God that covered you, the God that anointed you. Every single day, people put down God. And what do we do? I don't want a confrontation. I don't want a battle. What, what if I don't know what to say? What if I'm not equipped? What if they know more than I do? I don't want it. And so what do we do? We just run and cower 
and fear. But not David. David's like, hold up. Wait a minute. What is happening out here? Verse 26, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, David is putting their problem in a theological lens. David is like, yeah, I see the same giant that you guys see. Yeah, I see he's tall and he's big and he's loud, but he's uncircumcised. How he knew, I don't know, but he knew. And what David was saying was that that giant that you see that looks scary, he's out of covenant with God because circumcision was a sign that you were in covenant with God. And so David is like, yeah, he's big. Yeah, he's scary. Yeah, he's loud. But God is not with him. God is with us. So if God is with us, then even though this giant is scary, he has nothing on God. God is on our side. And so David's like, yeah, he's trying to attack us and murder us, but hey, he is uncircumcised. That's Christian cussing at its finest. At its finest. It doesn't get better than that. And so David starts asking this question amongst the soldiers. Boys, what's going on? I get it, he's big, but come on. God's on our side. We're the chosen people of God. We're the nation of Israel. What's going to happen? Verse 28. When Eliab, remember Eliab, David's oldest brother, he heard David speaking with the men. And he burned with anger at him, and he asked, Why have you come down here? And whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, David, and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Verse 29, Now, what have I done? said David. Can I speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. See, David's like, I can't deal with my brother right now. i got a bigger battle to face. I can't deal with this battle of Eliab right now when I got Goliath facing me right there. See, sometimes we deal with the wrong battles. Sometimes we're fighting the wrong giants. They were like, if I beat up my big brother right now, that does no one any good except me. But if I can kill Goliath, then everyone gets the victory. See, we got to pick and choose the right battles. Come on, husbands, just look at your wife and say, see, pastor said, pick and choose the right battles. Pick and choose the right battles. Not every battle is it. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not every battle is worth fighting. Not every battle is worth engaging in. you got to pick and choose the right battles. Verse 31. When David was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Saul was like, go get David. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from his mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by his hair, struck it, and I killed it. See, Saul knows that David's not full of it. Saul knows that David's not just blowing smoke. Why? Because David has been at the palace for the last year and a half helping old king boy deal with his nightmares. And so Saul knows when David steps into the room, the demons got to go. See, Saul, the king of Israel, didn't just go, okay, I'll put the whole nations in your hand, little shepherd boy. No, 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 no. Saul knew David was a man of God. Say, exactly. Saul knew that David was something special, that he had the anointing on his life. And so Saul knew David was the real deal. Now notice the heart of David. Notice what he's sharing with Saul. He's like, listen, we had a lot of conversations back at the palace, and you can, you can imagine, right, all the conversations and all the, the different things that they went through. But I need to tell you something. When I was back home living at my father's house, when a, when a lion would come or when a, when a bear would come and would try to take one of the sheep, I didn't just... I didn't just count that sheep as a loss. I left. I left the 99. I left the rest of the flock, and I went after that one. Does that sound familiar? I went after the one, and I grabbed that lion, and I grabbed that bear, and I rescued that sheep. See, I need to let you know that you're that one lost sheep that got away from the herd. And David was like, I went after the one. 
I know we didn't talk about this back at the palace, but I need you to know I'm not scared of lions or, or bears. Verse 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will, will be like one of them. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord has rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. And he will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. See, David had so much confidence in this present moment because of the faithfulness of God in his past. David is in this moment going, God deliver me then. I know God will deliver me now. God showed it for me way back then. I know God will show it for me right now. See, I need to get this in his spirit. That God who delivered you from all those things, that past life, those old mistakes, all the things that you went through, he delivered you then. That's the reason you're here right now. And guess what? The thing that you're facing in your life right now, he'll deliver you from that too. God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that split the Red Sea for Moses is the same God that is here right now. The same God who showed up for Daniel in the lion's den is the same God who's here right now. The same God who stepped into the fire with those three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is the same God who's here with us right now. Come on, the same God who sent manna from heaven is the same God who's with us right now. He's the same God. And see, David knew this, and David understood this. See, you got you to gotta look back over your life and go, when there was no way out, when it seemed impossible, when that big problem or that big giant was staring me right in the face and I, I didn't see a way out, guess what? The waymaker came and showed up. I've got to look back over my life and see all the ways that God has freed me, all the ways that God has rescued me to give me confidence for the new thing that I'm stepping into. See, this is what David understood. This is what Saul should have understood. Saul was filled with the Holy Ghost. Saul had victories over other armies, but yet he lacked the confidence in God in the present moment. Doesn't that sound like so many Christians today? Oh, God has healed my marriage, and God has healed my body, and God has taken care of bill after bill all throughout my life. But yet, you know, this, this new giant, this, this whatever your new giant is, it's like, bruh, just look back over your life. Look back over your life. Come on, if you don't think you're blessed, just look around you right now. God has been working in your life, your whole life. David understood this. But David, like God always shows up. See, later, when David's an older man, he writes in Psalm 37, I was young, and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen a righteous forsaken. He's like, God always comes through. I've never seen a child of God begging for bread. God always shows up. And so Saul then looks at David and says, may the Lord be with you. Good luck. Verse 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. See, Saul tried to give David his armor to go fight his battle. But David knew that his strength didn't come from the king. David knew that his strength came from the Lord. Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. Verse 42, he looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now, what you have to keep in mind is that when God established the nation of Israel all the way back with Abraham, God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So, Goliath didn't know it at the time, but when he said, David, I curse you, Goliath was actually breaking a Levitical law that was blasphemy of God. And you know what the punishment for breaking that law was? Stoning. Some of you will get that later. David said to the Philistine, verse 45, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
See, David wants to make something clear about this moment. He's saying, you come at me with a weapon, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. David's like, it's not me that fails to realize who you're going against. It's you that fails to realize who you're going against. I have God on my side. God is for me. Verse 46, the day the Lord, uh, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of this Philistine to the army, uh, the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. See, seven times David references the Lord in his speech. Notice the speech is longer than the battle. The argument is longer than the actual fight. Because the speech is the point. David references the Lord seven different times because David knows this is the Lord's battle. See, some of you guys are trying to fight too much. you got to let it go and say, this is the Lord's battle. I'm just going to get into his word. I'm just going to look at the promises of God. I'm just going to see what God says about me and give this battle to the Lord. That's the point of the whole story. David's like, I know I look little. I know I'm just a shepherd boy. Goliath, I know you're big and you're scary. But Goliath, what you feel to realize is that's all irrelevant. Because God's on my side. I hope you're getting this today. That I know sometimes you feel small and your problems seem big. But that's irrelevant. Because God's on your side. Verse 47. All, see, this is how you got to read the Bible at home. You just got to go through it and just talk about it. That's all we're doing. We're just reading the Bible and talking about it. Get this fired up in your own little prayer room. Come on, get this, get this fired up when it's just you and, and your Bible. Get this fired up like, all those gathered here. Well, no, that, that's what I'll be doing. Where I was like, you're crazy. I'm like, yeah, I'm just reading the Bible. It's good. Got to make it come alive, right? Verse 47, all those gathered here will, will know that this is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of, uh, and he will give all of you into our hands. And the Philistine moved closer to attack him. David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Verse 50. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And that's the story of David and Goliath. Now... How do we apply this story to our lives? Well, Goliath obviously is your fear. And Goliath is obviously your problems. And he's the, the giant that you're facing in your life. And David is obviously you. And you've got to be confident in God. You've got to go out and you've got to face your Goliath. And when that thing begins to taunt you and tell you who you are and who you're not, then you've got to have the confidence like David that God is on your side. That God has chosen me and anointed me to face this Goliath, and he's for me. That's how this message is typically preached. But I need to clue you in on something this morning. You are not David. You're not the hero. You're like, wait, what? I'm overlooked. I'm devalued. I'm anointed. I thought I was David. I want to be the hero. God's on my side. I'm confident. I hate to tell you, you're not David. Then who, who are we? We're the brothers. We're the scared soldiers. We're Saul. Scared to face Goliath. That we stand up and we want to fight, but as soon as Goliath begins to shout back, we run scared. First your team, you can come to him. We're powerless. We're helpless. Matter of fact, Goliath doesn't represent your problems. Goliath doesn't represent your depression or your anxiety or your boss. Because that's what we do, right? Oh, I'm facing this Goliath. I'm facing this battle. Goliath is not your money problems. Goliath is none of those things. You want to know who Goliath is? Goliath is your sin. Goliath is death. And who is the only person who can overcome your sin? Who is the only person that defeated death on your behalf? Oh, I know. A shepherd boy. 
from Bethlehem. Not David. Jesus. Jesus who doesn't appear to be a hero. Jesus doesn't look like a king. Jesus doesn't fight with a sword or a spear. Jesus shows up to the battlefield because why? He's obeying the will of his father. Jesus who comes to serve and not be served. Jesus who was mocked not by his brothers but by the religious rulers. Jesus who on the night of his death wasn't wearing any armor. Jesus looks your Goliath in the face. Jesus looks sin in the face. Jesus looks death in the face and says, who are you? To come against the armies of the living God. And Jesus, just like David, cut off the head of the giant. And Jesus has done the same thing for you. See, when David had cut off the head of the Philistine, the Bible says that all the army who was standing there behind David, who had been seeing this giant taunt them for 40 days, all of a sudden had courage. When they saw the giant fall, the Bible said that they all began to scream, ah, and they chased off the army of the Philistines. And that's the same thing that we get to do because Jesus killed our giant. He faced Goliath for us. He beat death for us. He overcame your sin for you. That's the gospel. That's our message, right? Christianity is not clean yourself up and try to get everything together and then maybe God will, will fight for you and maybe God will bust you. No, 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 friends, he already died for you. Christianity is admit you don't have it all together. Admit your soul. Admit you're the brothers. Admit you're the scared soldiers and you don't have enough courage and you don't have enough strength and you don't have enough power to face Goliath. And see, so many of us are dealing with real struggles, real difficulties, Real challenges. But the Bible says it's in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us throw off everything that hinders us. The sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the, the race marked out before us. How? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for who the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame, and is now sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endures such opposition from sinful men that you won't grow weary and lose heart. See, David, he went down into the valley of Elah to fight Goliath. But, they, uh, but Jesus went down into the pits of hell, into the shadow of death, to defeat sin on your behalf. No discouragement, no sin, no addiction, no tragedy, no shame, no guilt, no mistake can ever take away the victory that Jesus won on your behalf. We follow a victorious king. That you've won the battle. Not because of what you've done. But rather because of what your king did for you. That's good news. That's good news. See, David is just a picture of who Jesus is. And I know you don't think you're Jesus. So don't think you're David. But we serve the king. You know, I'll end with a story. I was watching an interview with a man who had studied Spartan culture. You know, the Spartans like, Sparta, prepare for glory. He studied the whole culture because he wanted to figure out why were these men so good at battle? How were they able to win so many wars despite their lack of numbers? They would face these large armies and they would win. How was this able to take place? Was it their shields? Was it their training? Was it their conditioning? Like, what was their secret? 
And so this man is interviewing, trying to figure out this question, and the, the guy looks back and says, you want to know what their secret was, the, the reason that they were able to, to win so many wars, the reason they were so good at fighting? He says, yeah, I want to know, what is it? He says, it's because whenever they would line up for battle, their king wouldn't stand in the back and conduct the war. Their king would be the first one to go fight. Their king would shout, and then he would go first. He would attack the enemy first, and because their king went first, it then freed them from all the fear that they had because if the king is going first, well then surely I can go. And so that gave them the confidence to follow the king. See, I don't know if you know this or not, but your king has gone first for you. Your king has won the battle on your behalf. And so quit acting scared. He's already overcome. He's already declared victory. He's already set you free. He's already given you the power uh, uh, of, of death, hell, and the grave. It's won on your behalf. Our king went first. We don't have to run in the face of Goliath anymore. We don't have to run in the face of our problems anymore. And here's the good news. Here's the best part. Is that when Jesus said, I'm going back to be with the Father, but I'm sending you a, a gift. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. See, now we have the gift of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us that then allows us and gives us power to then face all the small lies that we face every day. The giants of lust, of addiction, of whatever it is. We make up all these giants, right? See, we can overcome them through the power of the Holy Spirit that's living on the inside of us. <laughs> but the big giant, the big Goliath, the real one, it's already won. It's already won. That's the good news. And that's the story of David and Goliath, the unlikely hero. So let me pray for you, Lord. Thank you for, thank you for every single person represented in this room today. God, thank you that we can open up your word, God, that we can look at a, an iconic story like David and Goliath, and we can see you so clearly in that story. God, let us be reminded of what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. Let us be reminded each and every day that you've paid for our sins, you've defeated our giants, that we've overcome because of what you did for us. So God, let us walk in that truth. Let us live life with freedom, with courage, with boldness to be everything that you've called us to be, God. And let us not be reminded that you didn't leave us here by ourselves, but you sent the power of the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of us every single day to defeat all these other battles that we face. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for us, for fighting the battle for us. We bless the name of Jesus. We worship you, God. We praise you, God. Jesus name, amen. Oh, don't take it shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got